Now this morning, it's a great privilege of mine to invite Sister Angeline Francis who's going to preach for us. She had a word from the Lord and uh, so I said she should. So let us put our hands and welcome Angeline Francis. Thank you, Pastor Stephen. Uh, I open water for you, sister. Ah, yeah. It's yeah, so thank do you, the thank same you. by everybody. Eh? Just want to. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's my turn today. <laughs> good morning, everyone. And good morning, GMK family who's watching online. Good to see all of you here today. I'm quite excited. Actually, I'm very excited. So what happened was that on the 21st of January, I was woken up early in the morning at about 3.45 a.m. And uh, at that moment, the Holy Spirit told me these words. Okay, these words came, it was, I heard these words very clearly from the Holy Spirit. It said, God always proves he is never wrong. Okay, and I was just pondering upon this as I was getting ready for my prayer. And I was wondering why God said, never wrong. Why didn't he say, God is always right? You know, then it dawned to me, it's because we, because of our faith, which we do not have enough faith, that sometimes we say, maybe God is wrong. So that, that was, all this was going in my mind, okay? So anyway... After that, I got ready for prayer, and I prayed and I worshipped. And then this word kept coming again, and what I did was I stressed each word. I said, God always proves he's never wrong. God always proves he's never wrong. Amen? God always proves he's never wrong. God always proves he is never wrong. God always proves he is never wrong, is always happening. It was not a was. He's still doing. And finally, God always proves he is never wrong. Okay, amen. So after worship, I quietened down. And then the Lord revealed his heart to me. And after that, he gave me some instructions. So after that, I wrote everything down and then I went to bed. And then the next morning, on the 21st, that very morning, Pastor said, uh, Angeline, do you have any word uh, that you want to share with the congregation before we leave? You know, he said, I was like, wow. You know, I, I told him yes. And I was very overwhelmed because, you know, God is so good. He gave me the message before Pastor could ask me. Because imagine if Pastor asked me first and what I could have said, I'd be like, um, yeah, let me see. Or I would have said, okay, what, what message should I speak? Which part? You know, but God is so good. He told me beforehand. So that means when God calls you, oh, He always ensures that you are prepared. He knows you are ready. He knows you are equipped. He knows you can do it. That is why He asks you. And all you need to do is say, Okay, Lord, here I am to do your will. Amen. Amen. So I was very overwhelmed, so I'm excited to share with you. Before that, can we all pray? Let's bow our head. Abba Father, we thank you that you are with us here. Lord, thank you that you are here, Lord. Thank you, God. As I stand near you, God, thank you that you will use me as your mouthpiece. Let every word that comes from my mouth be of you. Lord, touch us. Give us seeing eyes, listening ears, and an understanding heart. Tune our hearts to yours, O oh Father, so that we will get a revelation, Father, of who you are, Lord. We thank you, Father, and we love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, now, can you open, it's the first part, okay, there are three parts to my message. So part one is all about faith. So can you open your Bible to Hebrews 11, 8, 10. Now, this will be the foundation text for today's message. And surprisingly, this was the very message that God gave Pastor Stephen and me regarding our move to Charlotte. So, 
It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land, that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. So this was the, the, the passage, the, the verse that the Lord gave me. So, you know, I have read this passage before. But somehow, this time, I was actually very intrigued about Abraham. And I was thinking, Abraham, we all know who Abraham is. You know, other than Moses, he was the most talked about character in the Old Testament. And he is known as the father of faith. And in James 2.23, uh, it says that Abraham believed God and he was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Amen. So, and I was just amazed with Abraham. Who is this Abraham? So I was looking through the, 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 the Bible and Abraham, you, you'll see the name Abraham starting from Genesis 12, 1 to 4. So can we have that scripture please? Now we can go back to the scripture now. Can you go to Genesis 12, verses 1 to 4? That's where we get to know about Abraham. Now, the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. 1 to 4. I will make of you a great nation and I'll bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went. Okay, Ab Abram. I'm just saying Abraham, okay? As the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now, so from this passage, we got to know about Abraham. Basically, he lives in this city of Ur, U-R. And I digged up some information about this city. It's actually a thriving city in Mesopotamia, near the river Euphrates. Okay, and uh, his father, Terah, moved from Ur to Haran, and they were residing there. And then Abraham, Abraham, he was a shepherd. He was 75 years old. And we also got to know that he's a very wealthy man. Because in verse 5, it says that Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had required. That means that all their possessions and all the people they required. So he was a very wealthy man. So I was thinking, Abraham, here's Abraham, he is a shepherd. Okay, he's a wealthy man. How in the world did he have such faith to just go to a place where God tells him to? And he is a pagan. He was living in a heathen land. How did he know the true living God? And he demonstrated such faith, you know, to leave the home where, you know, in those times, the fam, uh, unit, families living in units is very important. You, you usually, uh, you don't get to hear about families living far apart. You know, all living communally together. How, how did he live? What did Sarai say? Or what did his father Terah say? Or whoever else, what did they say? Or including, if he's a wealthy man, he would have been a very influential man. You know, I was just imagining. So what would his friends or his neighbors would have said? They could have um, questioned his wisdom. Are you sure you're doing the right thing? You know? So I was thinking about all this. And moreover, he is 75 years old. Can you believe when God say, I will make of you a great nation? And he doesn't even have one offspring. So I was very amazed. Okay, I was amazed because... When the Lord told us when we had to move, I had my struggles, which you all know, which I've talked about before. But I 
but we obeyed. No matter what, we obey the Lord. But I was just thinking, did Abraham go through all these feelings in him, you know? So as I was pondering upon this, I came to strongly believe that Abraham must have had an encounter with the true living God. What do you think? I think so too. Because prior to, uh, that means prior to Gen Genesis 12, he must have known the living God. And that was why in Genesis 12, when the Lord called him, he knew whose voice it was. He knew it was the voice of the Abba Father, the true God, Yahweh, who is calling upon him. So he must have had an encounter. And I was thinking, how could that be? But as I read the scriptures, I realized that Abraham was a worshiper of God because when he made his way to Canaan, wherever God spoke to him or where he settled down, he will build a place of altar for God, which Lot didn't do, but Abraham did. So he was a worshiper of God. And I was just thinking about, I was thinking maybe, you know, he was searching for the true living God. He wanted to know who it was. I'm think, I, was, I thought that way because I was like that before. When I was young, I was searching for the true living God for so long. I tried out religions. I remember even when I was below 12, I used to question God. I said, God, who, who is the real you? And I used to ask God, what is the purpose of me being in this earth? What am, I what am I here for? Is it just to live, get married, and die? That's it? Isn't that something more than that? So all these questions used to run my mind until I met the true living God. And after that, there was no turning back for me. I would do anything that God tells me to. So I think Abraham would have questioned. He would have quizzed about this. And one day, he had that beautiful revelation of God. But God spoke to him. And you know what? God could have chosen him because God knew his heart. Not because he was a shepherd. God knew his heart. And you know that when he speaks to, to Abraham, Abraham will obey. So you see, brothers and sisters, when God chooses you, he chooses you because of your heart. Not because of your talents or Whatever else that you may know, not because you are married, not married, got children, no children, you're single, he doesn't see all that. It's whether you have the heart to obey. So, I just wanted to say that Abraham, when he heard, when he found out the true living God, he had this resolve in him that he will only obey him, that he will always obey him, that he will never, ever take a step back from God. Amen. And that was why he left for Canaan. So, just like Abraham, when God calls us, let us not give excuse, but take that bold step to, step to obey him. Amen. All right. So, let's continue. So, Abraham goes to Canaan. And guess what happens in Canaan? If you look at Scripture, Genesis 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. Imagine the shock Abraham would have had. Gosh, God tells me to come to Canaan, and Canaan is facing a famine now. Did he go back to Haran? Did he go back? He did not. Because he resolved to follow God only. Amen. But I think here he could have done a mistake. Instead of seeking the Lord to find out what he should do next, he sojourned to Egypt. And you all know what happened in Egypt. He lied about his relationship with his wife, all because he wanted to protect his life. And then I was thinking, hmm, here is Abraham. He wanted to obey God. He left to a place where he didn't even know where it was. But at this moment, he feared for his life suddenly. Didn't he fear his life at that moment when the Lord told him to move? So I think 
Abraham, um, Abraham shifted his eyes from God to his circumstance. And that was why he was not aligned with God anymore. You know what I mean? His faith could have left him. So that was why when he saw the situation, instead of looking, keeping his eyes on God, he could have seen the situation and decided to take matters into his own hands. So that was a failure of, of the character of Abraham. But you see, God is so good. He didn't, um, he didn't uh, curse Abraham. He just blessed him. He just forgave him and blessed him. Because when Abraham left Egypt, he, he was blessed with so much of wealth, more possession. Amen. So God knows that we women, are, we children of him are weak. <laughs> Not women. <laughs> okay. We men are weak. <laughs> we are men. We are men. Okay. And he knows that when we are weak, we, we make mistakes. And God knows that. He understands us so much. Amen. So, what did God do? So, he protected and blessed Abraham despite his lack of faith at that moment. Because God honored that first step that Abraham made, which was taking the step to go towards Canaan. So, whatever happens along the way, if you, if you lack faith, God is going to still protect you and bless you. So even now when we are all in fearful of this coronavirus, we may lack faith. But God knows He will protect us. He will bless us. Amen. Amen. Okay, so God never chooses a perfect man. He only chooses someone with the, perf with the right heart. All right, so we continue. So, from Egypt, Abraham went back to Canaan, and again God spoke to him. He said, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth. You know, when, when God said that, he didn't say, yeah, yeah, right. Yes, Lord. That's uh, Genesis 13, 14 to 17. Okay? So, he didn't doubt. He didn't mock God. He believed God. Amen. And we shall look at one more scripture, which is Genesis 15, verse 3 to 4. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. One more verse. And, be, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir. Your own son shall be your heir. And he said, and he brought him outside. Please continue. And he said, look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So Abraham, you see, God gave the word 25 years ago when he was 75. And Abraham had Isaac when he was 100 years old. 25 years of waiting. So here, I used to think, Lord, why did you have to say it so much earlier, you know? But I think God has said it that early so that Abraham can move forward with his eyes fixed on him, knowing that God will bless him with an offspring. But what we tend to do is, we think that when, when the Lord gives us a, a, a prophecy, we think it's going to take place in the next few months, maybe the next year, not knowing that sometimes his prophecy can be so far many years uh, in time. Example, like how uh, Pastor Stephen has said when I was 15 and a half, the Lord said that he will bring him to nations. But that only happened, uh, happened 30 years later to Germany. Amen. So, Abraham had patience. He didn't doubt. He didn't mock God. So what can we learn from him? That when God gives us a word, we have to hold on to it, knowing and trusting that it will come to pass. No matter how long it takes, it will happen. God always proves he is never wrong. Amen. So, 
Therefore, Abraham was a friend of God. He was a father of faith. He was a man of courage, patience, strength. He had strong convictions. He didn't give up halfway. So God wants people with strong convictions, with a, with a steadfast spirit, so that no matter what happens, we do not go back. When we put our hand on the plough, we will never turn back. That's the kind of people, that's the kind of laborers, children, servants that he wants. And you see, when Abraham had an encounter, he changed. That is the most important part. It's not about having the encounter and you feel goosebumps all over you. And you say, ooh, I feel like you know, floating. Some, some people, you know, you have this kind of experience. I see gold dust. They tell me that too. But the question is, did that encounter change you and transform you? That is the important thing. So for Abraham... He had, I believe, he had a supernatural experience. But he didn't go around telling people, you know, I had this experience. But what he did was he proved to God that he is a changed man by obeying him. And that is what God wants from us. He wants us to have a life of obedience. Because faith without actions is dead. Because we can have all the faith. But are we bold enough to take that first step forward. And that needs boldness, and that is action. So, well, I'm, I'm, I'm awed with Abraham that he had the supernatural experience, and instead of doing nothing, he proved to God, and he went forward. So today, God is telling us to have the same faith as Abraham. He wants us to believe him beyond any doubt. Beyond any doubt, because God is never wrong, and we are His children, will be His witnesses Test, to testify that God is never wrong. Amen. So, we in JMK, now we all have had encounters like Abraham. Have we changed? Are we convicted? Have we have, do we have a, res, a resolution in our heart? No matter what happens, I will only follow God. Do you have that resolve in you? Has that encounter, have those encounters changed you? So that is something I would like you to reflect upon, which I did too. And we have received prophecies after prophecies in this church and conferences. What have we done with them? Did we act upon them? Did we take the prophecy seriously, first of all? Or did we think God was just making a suggestion? And do we trust the word of God? Like, I, um, you know, Pastor Stephen has said many times when he was young, he used to read the word and cry over the scriptures, knowing that God has spoken to him. For example, like in Psalms 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you, when you read that, do you receive it, knowing that it is word of God spoken to me? Do you receive it in faith? It is not just about prophecies, but it's also about the word of God. Do we believe, do we trust the word of God? That every word that is there, every promise that is given there, it is for you. Amen. So, just like Abraham, when we focus on our circumstances, suddenly our perspective changed. Now God looks very small, looks very distant. And that was why Abraham made that mistake. He lied. He, he did all this mistake, went to, to Egypt and all that. So, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, no matter what. Yes, it is tough. It is not easy, but we can do it by the Spirit of God. Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen? And God never makes mistakes. Though we should never, ever, ever doubt Him. It's due to our limited knowledge and wisdom that we tend to, to doubt Him. But God has proven again and again in our lives and the Bible that His Word is always true. Amen. Amen. What God says He will do, He will do. We must stand in faith. Amen. So, in JMK, every week we have testimony. And sometimes when you hear those testimonies, 
You just can't believe it, isn't it? God has done impossible things in your lives. Amen. Amen. So before I share more about that, I just want to share a, toss, uh, a short testimony of mine where the impossible happened. Okay? So basically, when I was young, every June and December holidays, I, my family and I will take the train and go to my grandma's hometown in Sitia One. Okay, and I love to go there because my grandma has a farm. She has goats, she has uh, cows, and then she had all the fruit trees and vegetable plants and all that. And I love to go there because I'm always, you know, we are all cooped up in our HDB flat. Okay, so once I go there, that's it. I'm just loose, free. So I will... You know, it's just running around. Sometimes my grandma will say, uh, go and pluck some brinjal. I'm going to make curry. So I'll just go to the garden and pluck some brinjals. I still remember that. And tomatoes. And then I will climb the guava tree and pluck the guava and just taste them. It's so delicious without any steroids in it, you know. And then uh, I would play masa masa. And mine is not a play, play, masa, masa, real masa, masa, with real fire, real vegetables, real curry powder, and I'll cook. I tell you, it, those were the days. And I think since that time, I always loved rural life. Rural life. I never liked the city. I never liked flats. I never liked buildings. I just wanted a small house, a kampong house, and just have a garden and stay there, you know? And <laughs> come, yeah. <laughs> God is so good. Okay. And then a few years ago, the Lord gave me this word. Oh, yeah. I, I even told Pastor, I, I used to tell Pastor, I said, God is going to give us a house. He said, you're good. Like, yeah, okay. But he will not say anything. He just said, I'll say, it's not just a house, but with a backyard, with a garden where we can plant trees. He said, Okay. He'll just say, okay. And I even would tell him sometimes, I'll say, you know, I wish I was born in the 50s. I wish I lived in the 70s. Life was so simple, no technology. You know, I don't know, I'm sure some of you will agree with me. Life was beautiful at that time. My childhood was, in that sense, was beautiful. So one day the Lord gave me this verse. It just sort of, I just got this word. Psalm 16, verse 6. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. It is Psalm 16, 6. Now, when I saw that, I know God is going to give me a land. I just knew it. But I really thought it's just going to be like a maybe half acre kind of thing with, you know, a house and how, only half acre. <laughs> okay, like quarter acre maybe. So, so I knew it. But I thought maybe he'll give it to me in Malaysia. I was telling pastor, let's go to Malaysia, look for a place. And then, and I thought, I'm going to have this place in my retiring age. After 60s, 70s, you know. And lo and behold, you know what happened last year? The Lord told us to move to Charlotte, King's Mountain. Well, thank God we have Google now. We can at least know where the place is. not like Abraham. He didn't even know where this land was. <laughs> Amen. So, you know, I'm so thankful for that. And we could actually see Google and see the place. But I just can't believe that Pastor and I, we own a land now, a big land with where we are going to plant fruit trees and vegetables. And uh, maybe we will rear some chickens and uh, pesticide-free plants, vegetables, yes. Uh, chickens without any injections, you know, hormone, hormonal injections. So I'm going to have organic. I always talk about organic. And this time I'll have cheap organic food. But... I know that it's not going to be easy. Just like how when Abraham went, there was a famine. It's not going to be easy, I know that. It's a foreign land. It's a foreign culture. I mean, you can't even just walk to the shop. You need to have a, 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 trans, a mode of transportation to just to go to a shop. You know what I mean? So there, there are going to be struggles. But from this message that I prepared... 
now I really know for sure that I need to focus, keep my eyes fixed on Jesus and not at those circumstances. Amen. So this is a powerful testimony for me. And his word is always true because I never doubted. I just saw it happen later, but I didn't expect it to be so soon. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? So, shall we all look forward to Jesus, fix our eyes on him, and walk forward with unwavering faith in him? Amen. All right, now I'm going to go to part two. Can you put me, put the, uh, fix me to the iPad? Yeah. Now, this is part two where, where God's heart was revealed to me. You know, that day on the 21st of January, after prayer, God revealed his heart to me and he said these words, which I was quite burdened. But I know that the Lord is telling for us so that, so that we will be transformed. He said, I still need to prove my worthiness to my children. They have seen my providence, goodness, love and strength, and yet they run after other gods which lead them to death. No, I was very burdened when God said, I still need to prove. He's like asking, do I still need to prove? And he says that he has given us providence, he has given us goodness, love, strength. Does he still need to prove to us? Why do we still doubt him? Why do we still think that he could have made a mistake? When he gives his word, when he gives a promise, he will do it. Amen. So the Lord is saying, but my children are running after other gods, which we all know. It's money, career, position, anything else that takes our eyes away from him, they are the gods. And he says that these lead them to death. So you can see in Singapore how we in Singapore, we slog. Slog so much that we spend the whole day at work, night at work, and we come home late in the night and we go to bed. That's happening in many families that you, they don't even get to enjoy their homes that they bought. And many are stressed in this rat race overwhelmed by sickness and you know that Singapore is considered as one of the least happiest nations in the world. So, well, we have to do something about it. So God is seeing our heart. He's saying that instead of trusting Him, we are depending on our own resources and capabilities. But He is saying, come to me. Right? He's saying, come to me. I am the one who is going to refresh you. So we continue now. And he says, So arise, my children. Be my witness of how I can change one's life completely like yours. You who were in the bottomless pit, I have lifted you up and crowned you with love and compassion. And I think whoever you are here, you know what God is talking about. How many of you here, you were in the bottomless pit before? That's me. I mean, you don't have to lift your hands, but uh, I'm just asking you to reflect. I think most of us were. So God is saying, He has changed our life. Like example for me, I was really in the pit and God lifted me up from the miry clay. He cleansed me. He washed me. He gave me a new identity. He gave me a new family. He gave me a new position in Christ and He gave me a new name my baptized name. And I think we should just be so overwhelmed with thanksgiving for what He has done in our lives. Does He still need to prove His worthiness? I don't think so. Amen. So He's saying, He lifted you up and He crowned you. We are His prince and princesses. And He has crowned us with love and honour. Shouldn't we give that back to Him? Shouldn't we love Him with all our hearts and honour Him as our true living God? So this is something for us to reflect upon. And then He continues, He says,
Many fear of losing to this world, but I have called them out of this world. So stop trying to prove yourself to the world that you are worthy. Instead, come to me and I will show you your worth. Now, many fear. Now, I think fear is the biggest challenge all of us have. Okay? Fear of living, fear of losing out, fear of what men will think of us, fear, fear of men, what... Uh, do they talk about us? You know, one is face value, what men think of us. The other fear is losing out to this world. And this fear comes because we are focused on ourselves, And that's how that fear comes. So God is saying, don't focus on yourself, focus on Him. And He is saying, if you, the thing is, He's saying, you are fearing of losing in this world, but you are not of this world, aren't you? When you were translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the dear son, we are not of this world. So the world is against us. So why do we need to prove to this world about our worthiness? But you look at the compassion, the love that God has for us. He's saying, don't try to prove yourself to the world. Come to me and I will show you your worth. He's saying that he will show us how worthy, how precious we are to him. Isn't God good? And we don't even have to prove to Him anything because the fact that we have faith in Him is credited as righteousness. Amen. So God is saying, come to me. Rely on me. So if you are worried about the world, about your living, your career, we have Matthew 6.33 which says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and everything else shall be added unto you. And that is all we need to do. So stop proving to the world you're worthy and come to God because the world will always try to disqualify you. Only God will find one matter of yours to qualify you. He will look, even if you're the most greatest sinner, He will still look for one quality of you to qualify you. Amen. Amen. So God wants to prove how worthy we are to Him. We are worthy to be His son and daughter. Hallelujah. All right. This is the next part that he's, he's, He talks. So He says, So come to me. Lean on me. Rely on me. Doing in all my strength and none from yours. In this world, nothing is worthy other than me my call in your life, and your time with me and my word. God is inviting you to come to him, to rely on him, to do everything in his strength and not on your strength, as in Philippians 4.13. You know, call in our life, our time with God, for some of us, is the least in priority. And I remember pastor uh, preaching in... Uh, few months ago last year when he said that, when God said that what we regard rubbish as here is precious in heaven and what we regard precious here is considered as rubbish in heaven and you know what I'm talking about. So God is saying, come to him and rest. And Pastor Michael Vijaja spoke about rest last week, didn't he? He said that when you come into rest, you are strengthened. You are revived. And he said that you become productive. You will have dominion. You can possess. You can subdue enemies. When God allows, when we allow God to minister to our hearts and to our spirit. So God is saying, come and rest in Him. And reading the Word of God is a form of rest. Do you know that reading the Word of God is also healing? Now, if we look at Proverbs 4, verses 20 to 22, this was said by Kenneth Hagin when he said that the word is our medicine. Proverbs 4, verse 20 to 26. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. So the Lord is telling you to make 
rest is the most important part of your life, to rest in Him, to rest and read His Word, to read His Word, and that is healing for you. And uh, during the SOP, pastor spoke about tithing your time to the Lord. So in a day, you have 24 hours, right? So what is a tenth of that? 2.4 hours. So can we dedicate 2.4 hours for the Lord to pray, to seek Him, to read the Word, to just have quiet, and ta- quiet time with Him? Amen. Amen. Let that be our priority from now on. Strive to know Him, love Him, revere Him, know His Word. And this is the last part of his word. He says, can you go back to my iPad? He says, you are my pride and joy. Stand victoriously for such a time as this when you need to be planted firmly in me. I will prove you wrong of whatever you thought I can do and I can't do. Wow, I was a bit amazed at the last sentence when he said, and I was thinking what he was trying to say. So first of all, He's saying that we are his pride and joy. Now, many of us here, we have a lot of condemnation in our hearts. And Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You see, we are humans, we make mistakes. But all we need to do is to come in full, total repentance and God forgives us. He doesn't even remember our sins anymore. It's in Isaiah 43. He said he blots out our sins. He doesn't remember them. But we remember them. And that stops us from coming near to God. Today, God is saying, you are my pride and joy. Yes, you have made mistakes, but it's okay. You have repented. I've forgiven you. You are my pride and joy. And, you know, reading the word not only heals, it, is also sanct- it also sanctifies you. You know, I was so shocked when I read John 15.3 the other day. John 15.3, where Jesus tells his disciples, he says, You already, you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Wow. When we read the word, we are sanctified. That is why when we go on a fast, it is no use Fasting from food without reading the word. You're just dieting. But when you fast with reading of the word, you are sanctified within. Amen. What a powerful, how powerful is this word of God? And we are so thankful that we are able to to have hold of this word of God where in many countries we are not able to. So, He's saying he will prove, oh sorry, um, yes. He says he will prove you he is never wrong of whatever he thought he can do. So I said, Lord, what he's trying to say. Then I understood. He's saying that you thought that God will do this way to deliver you out of an issue. But God is saying, no, I'm, no, that's not the way I'm going to do. I'm going to do it in a far different, miraculous way that you can't even think of because our knowledge is so limited. So God is saying, can you go back to my slide? He's saying, I will prove you that I'm never wrong of whatever I can, you thought I can do because he can do much, much in a much bigger, magnanimous way. And he says, I will prove you that I'm never wrong of whatever you thought I can't do. When you thought you can't, when you thought God can't help you through the situation, but God will. He will prove you wrong. Amen. Amen. So I, I really thank the Lord for these words because as in Psalms 18:30, God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. If you go to Psalms 18:30. He is a shield for those who take refuge. So God always proves He is true. He is never wrong. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now we will go on to the third part, which is the last part, where God gave some instructions for us. All right, first thing He said was, contain in me. That's the first word He said. And I decided to look up the dictionary. 
I mean, first I jotted everything down, and then later on, when I wanted to expound on this, when I look in the dictionary, these are the words. So, to contain in Jesus means to keep in limit, to check your ways, to halt, to be within Him, hold Him, comprise in Him, include Him in everything you do, enclose, be enclosed in Him, be bound to Him, bear up, to be bared up by Him. So, we just need to abide in Jesus. You know, when the moment he said, contain in me, the first thing, the vision that came to, to me was a container. You know, the tapau container. So I was looking at that, I was thinking, okay, so God is saying, contain in him. Let's say if you have an issue, like a container, he's saying, when we are in him, uh, we will be able to overcome anything. And then, the vision from a container went to a container lorry. And I was like, okay, so God is bigger than that. And then what was the next vision? A container ship. So God is that magnanimous. So nothing is impossible for Him. We just need to contain in Him. We need to abide in Him. Amen. So He says, I'm the wine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in Him. He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And there's one thing we need to keep telling the Lord. Lord, I can never do anything apart from you. Amen. Okay, next he said, he gave eight instructions. So the second one he says, contribute to my cause. Contribute means to give a supply in common with others, to give a part to a common fund, play a significant part in bringing about an end result. So God is saying, if you love me, serve me, be fruitful, bless others. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servants be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So this is something that Pastor Stephen always preaches in our church. Do something for the Lord. It can be anything. You can even be the doorkeeper. Anything for the Lord. And God will honor us. Amen. So we need to contribute to kingdom purposes. We need to be kingdom-minded to contribute to kingdom purposes. Amen? All right. Then, then he said, correspond with my word. What is correspond? Correspond means to be in conformity or agreement, to compare closely or to be equivalent to. So God is telling Strive to conform to me. He's telling, strive, uh, sorry, live a life of progression and transformation. That, he, that means as a life of a believer, we can never be in a standstill. We all know that. We either backslide or we move forward. So God is saying, move forward with me. Transform, be transformed by the word. He's saying, live a life of righteousness and holiness. Holiness, that means in whatever you do, it must show Christ-likeness. And it's just not about having faith. It's about doing. That's the important part. Just like Abraham, he had faith, but he did. He did the action of moving to Canaan. So in the same way, the Lord is saying, it's not just having the faith, but we must be doers of the word in James, us in James. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness to your heart. Let's be doers of word. Next he said, contend for your faith. Contend means to maintain, assert, battle, struggle, fight against all difficulties. Now this is the word given to us last year that as believers in the end times, we will be vulnerable to apostasy and easy grace. Now, apostasy means abandoning your faith. There will come a time where we will be put to the test. But the Lord is saying, hold on. Hold on to me. Never give up on your faith. On, on, on your faith. And easy grace, where as in, uh, I will read from Jude 1 to 4. Easy grace where... False teachers will bring in false teachings, saying that it's okay to sin, you're already forgiven. And people 
are seduced by these words. And so they abandon their faith and they follow this easy grace uh, module, easy grace way. So in James 1, 3 to 4, it says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our Oh, sorry, Jude 1, 3 to 4, sorry. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So, the Lord is telling us to contend for our faith, especially in the end times where we'll be tempted. We could be forsaken. We may feel that we could be forsaken. But no matter what, we need to know, we need to hold on to the fact that God is always good. Amen? Okay, next he said, be contented. Content means to be satisfied. He's just telling us to have a heart of thanksgiving. You know, in Psalms 50, 23, it says, it is written that the one who offers thanksgiving a sacrifice glorifies the Lord. You know, the fact that we move, we eat, we breathe, it's because of the Lord. Amen? So even if we may have nothing, we have to be thankful to the Lord that we are alive. And I think having a content heart is a blessing. Because just recently, I was just talking to my aunt, a former neighbor, and she was so upset. And she, I asked what happened. She said, you know, I went to the polyclinic. I had this you know, usually they have four numbers, uh, the identification number in the polyclinic, not of the IC. It was a different number. And she said, okay, when I go back, she's not a believer. When I go back home, I'm going to take uh, 4D. I'm going to take 4D. Okay. But the thing is, when she went back home, she was so tired that she didn't go to the shop to get the 4D. And next day, that number was first price. <laughs> and she said she cried the whole day. Whole day. $4,000. She said she missed. And she cried and she called me and she cried. And I was just thinking in my heart, Lord, I mean, of course I, I, I comforted her, but I was just thinking, Lord, thank you for giving me a content heart. You know, that, that peace, that content is something that no one else can give other than the Lord. Amen. Amen. So that is what we need to Ask for, for a content heart, a heart of thanksgiving. And that is what the Lord wants us to have. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rest content, untouched by trouble, including now. Amen. Amen. Okay, next. God says, walk continuously with me. Continuously is without interruption, with, an eye, with our eyes fixed on the Lord. So the verse for this I just wanted to read is, Therefore, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We need to lay aside every weight. I remember, I can't remember which preacher who said that. I think, I can't remember. But he said that, you know, God's, God's desire is for his children to fly like an eagle. But the problem is, because of the, all the weights that are attached to us, we are unable to fly. But what the Lord wants us to shed off the weight, shed off, shed off all weight, and to fly like an eagle. Amen. It is tough, but with the Lord, anything is possible. We can do all things in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, if our eyes are fixed on Him, if our eyes are fixed on things above and not on things beneath, we can move forward. 
Then he says, be collective. You know, I saw collective or just this morning, I, we, we on the CNA and we saw the words that one of the MPs said that uh, he wants collective defense from now on. He says that every citizen has to pay a, pay, uh, play a part in keeping this coronavirus at bay. So he, he didn't want this self, selfishness where everyone is hoarding things, you know, hoarding the masks, the sanitizers, that those who really need it, they do not have it. So, exactly. So um, the MP said that we need to have collective defense. So in the same way, the Lord is saying be collective. Be one body in Christ. Be united. Collective means to be united, shared, pooled, mutual, common, and joined. So for that, you know, we cannot be collective and without love. We need to have love. And Jesus said, only when you love one another, you are known to be a disciple of me. So, this love, it's not just about having this feeling in your heart, but it's about action. It's about doing something for others that you would like it to be done for yourself. So, have a, uh, sorry, we know that we have passed out of death unto life because we love the brothers. Whoever who does not love abide in death. Wow. You know, when the first time I read the scripture, that really gripped my heart. If we don't love, we abide in death. So we need to love because God is love. As we are children of God, we must abide in love. And that love only the Lord can give. We can't love others with that human love because we will tend to judge. But when we ask God for the divine love, and when that abides in our heart, it is so easy to look at another person through the lens of Christ. Amen? And God also said, love one another and also deal with your isolation. Because you can love a person so much, but if you don't get together, you are not being you are not being bad up by others. You need others to help you. You cannot survive alone in the end times. So not neglecting to meet together as a habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more you see the day drawing near. So especially now at this season, we need to be together. We need to be united for the purposes of the kingdom. Amen? And this is the last one, overcome confusion. Just as I said just now in content for your faith, you see, we are going to hear all kinds of teachings, but we must not get distracted. We must not get confused. We need to know the Word of God like the back of our hand. We need to be single-minded in purpose so that even when we make that step and we could have seen, like Abraham, a famine in front of us, we will not detour to Egypt but we will still move forward. Amen. So God is saying, remove. Be, uh, remove confusion. Be single-minded. You know, some of us have this, this habit of having indecisiveness. And that is something we need to ask the Lord to remove. We need to have, in these times, we need to have decisiveness. When we decide to follow the Lord, we follow. No turning back. So brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of, Jesus, of God in Christ Jesus. Our goal is to press on towards the goal. And what is that goal? Our crown. Do not ever give up this crown for anyone else. It is your crown which is for you Go for it. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, this is what we are going to declare today. This, these words were from God and He is telling us to believe Him. Yes. Okay, so shall we all arise? We're going to declare together and we're going to pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. All right, we are going to declare. Shall we all read together? One, two.
3. I will contain myself in God. I will contribute to the cause of God. I will correspond my ways with the word of God. I will contend for my faith. I will always be contented. I will walk continuously with God. I will be collective. I will overcome confusion. So finally, God is still moving and proving how great He is. God is never wrong. He is always, always, always right. Amen. Shall we all pray?